Good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Hope you're feeling as uh, rested and recharged as uh, many of us here at the White House. I know that I am. Uh, some of you are, although I don't see too many tan faces uh, in the audience, just on the side. Um, so, so happy new year to you, Goyle. So. Uh, I don't have anything to start, Julie, so let's go straight to your questions. Thanks, Josh. Happy New Year. Um, Congress comes back tomorrow with Republicans in charge, and I'm wondering if the President has spoken to Mitch McConnell or other Republican leaders, either while he was in Hawaii or since he's been back, uh, and if he has any plans to meet with them this week. Mm -hmm. uh, Julie, I, I don't know of any presidential calls that occurred uh, while the President was in Hawaii. I, uh, I believe that both uh, the President and the incoming Senate Majority Leader were uh, uh, spending some downtime with families over the holidays. but. Uh, I would anticipate that uh, the President will uh, have an opportunity to sit down uh, with congressional leaders in the first couple of weeks that they're back here. Uh, I don't have a specific date uh, at this point, but I would anticipate that that's something that, uh, that will happen, if not, uh, if not this week, then the week or two after that. He's um, occasionally spoken to Republicans at their retreat. That's in Pennsylvania this year. Do you know if he has plans to travel to that? Uh, I, don't, been invited to uh, I don't know whether or not he's been invited. Uh, I am aware that, that, is, uh, that those are their plans. Uh, but I don't know yet whether or not the President will attend. Okay. One of the first things that McConnell has said that he plans to bring up is the Keystone Pipeline. There's going to be a hearing on it on Wednesday. The House plans to vote relatively soon. The President was pretty noncommittal in his end-of-the-year press conference uh, when he was asked about a veto. He said, we'll take that up in the new year. We're now in the new year. We know that this is coming up. If Congress sends him a bill uh, forcing him to move forward on the Keystone Pipeline, will he veto it? Well, we'll uh, I'm going to reserve judgment on a specific piece of legislation until we actually see what language is included in that specific piece of legislation. I will say, uh, as you noted, uh, Julie, he did discuss this at his end of the year news conference a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and he did note that the pipeline would have, what I think what he described as a nominal impact on gas prices in this country. Uh, but he was concerned about the impact that it could have on carbon pollution uh, and the contribution it could make to carbon pollution. Uh, the negative impact that that has on the public health of people all across the country, uh, and the impact that that has on our ability to uh, build uh, communities across the country as we see uh, weather disasters worsen, as we see in the form of wildfires or more severe hurricanes, that only adds to costs. So the President does uh, harbor those concerns. Uh, the other concern, frankly, that we have is that this is a uh, – that, that uh, pipeline projects like this in the past uh, have been resolved in a, in a fairly straightforward administrative way, that there is a process that is conducted uh, by the State Department to evaluate uh, a project and determine whether or not it's in the national interest of the United States. That's how previous pipelines like this have been considered, and we believe this, this one should be considered in that same way, too. The last thing I'll say about this is there also is a, an outstanding uh, ruling that uh, we're waiting on from a judge in the state of Nebraska to determine what the route of the pipeline would be if it's built through the state of Nebraska. So which means there's actually not a finalized plan uh, on the table yet for uh, final uh, sign-off. So uh, there, uh, we don't want to put the cart before the horse here, and that is why in the past we've taken a rather dim view uh, of legislative attempts to circumvent this well-established process. So all that said, uh, I'm not prepared at this point to um, to issue a veto threat related to that specific piece of legislation, but we will uh, take a careful look at it uh, with all those things in mind. Is it fair to say that the President would be urging Democrats to vote against the legislation approving the pipeline? Well, I, we'll see what the, what the legislation actually includes before we start urging people to vote one way or the other. Okay, if I can just ask one, one other topic. Sure. Uh, this is something that came up while the President was in Hawaii. Uh, Representative Steve Scalise apologized for uh, speaking to a white supremacist, white supremacist group 12 years ago. Does the President believe that Scalise should stay in leadership? <clears throat> well, Julie, it is the responsibility of members of the House Republican Conference to choose their leaders. Uh, and I'm confident that in previous situations we've seen members of the conference actually make the case that who they choose to serve in their leadership says a lot about who they are, uh, what their values are, and what the priorities of the conference should be. Now, we've also heard a lot from Republicans particularly over the last few years, including the chairman of the Republican Party, about how Republicans need to broaden their appeal to young people and to women, to gays and to minorities, that the success of their party will depend on their ability to broaden that outreach. So it ultimately will be up to individual Republicans in Congress to decide whether or not 
elevating Mr. Scalise into leadership uh, will effectively reinforce that strategy. So far, Republican leadership seems to be standing by Scalise. Does the President feel that's appropriate? Well, uh, he believes that it's, that it's ultimately their decision to make. Um, but there is no, there's no arguing that who Republicans decide to elevate into a leadership position says a lot about who, what the conference's priorities uh, and values are. And, I mean, ultimately, Mr. Scalise reportedly described himself as David Duke without the baggage. Uh, so it'll be up to Republicans to decide what that says about their conference. Jeff. Josh, um, the Afghan president said in an interview broadcast on Sunday that the United States should consider um, re-examining its timetable for taking U.S. and coalition troops out of Afghanistan. Is that something that the White House has discussed with him, and is it something that the U.S. would consider at this point? Well, Jeff, what the, what the President has been really clear about is our, what our strategy in Afghanistan is, that after the uh, end of the year, we are now in a situation where the combat mission uh, in Afghanistan for U.S. military personnel has ended. Uh, the Afghans are now solely responsible for the security of their country. There is an enduring U.S. military presence and NATO coalition military presence in Afghanistan to carry out two other missions. Uh, the first is uh, a counterterrorism mission. We continue to see remnants of Al Qaeda uh, that do have designs on destabilizing the region uh, and U.S. interests. Uh, we also continue to see a need for U.S. military personnel to play an important role uh, in uh, training and equipping Afghan security forces to continue to take the fight uh, to those terrorist elements and to uh, preserve the security situation uh, in the country of Afghanistan. There are a lot of hard-won uh, gains that have been made in Afghanistan as a result of the bravery, bravery of uh, U.S. military personnel and our coalition partners. Uh, much of that work, m many of those accomplishments uh, are due to the effective coordination between the United States military and Afghan security forces, and we want to see that kind of uh, coordination continue even as Republicans take sole, um, I'm Republicans, even as Afghans take sole responsibility uh, for their uh, security situation. So we're all still sort of get working out the cobwebs from the uh, from the layoff. So, what uh, was your reaction then, or the White House's reaction to his comments? In that interview? Well, I, and, and I guess this is the other part of the answer that's also important: is the fact that we continue to have military personnel in Afghanistan to carry out these two missions, the counterterrorism mission and the uh, the training mission, the training of Afghan security forces. Uh, is indicative of the ongoing commitment that the United States has to the government of Afghanistan, that we built uh, a strong working relationship uh, with the unified government there, and uh, the United States uh, and countries around the world who have invested so much in Afghan security uh, continue to be invested in the success, uh, both political and economic, uh, of the Afghan people. Uh, and uh, the United States is uh, prepared to, uh, um, uh, to continue that a partnership. But as it relates to the strategy associated with our military footprint, uh, we've been pretty clear about what that strategy is. More importantly, the Commander in Chief has been clear about what that strategy is. On a separate topic, oil prices continue to fall, um, with some resulting falls in the stock market today. Um, is the White House concerned about this trend? And are you watching it? What is your reaction to it? Well, I'll say a couple of things about that. The first is I'm always very hesitant to to draw any conclusions or um, offer any analysis about movements in um, the stock market. Uh, I know that there are some who have observed this is a little bit of a chicken and the egg thing, that some of the fall in energy prices is a, relate, uh, is, uh, is a direct response to um, a weakening of the economy and a fall in the, in the, uh, in the stock market. So uh, it may not be that one is causing the other. Um, there could sort of be a reinforcing uh, effect there. What I will say more broadly uh, is that we've talked before about why we believe uh, that falling gas prices uh, are, as a general matter, uh, pretty good for the economy. And it certainly is good for uh, middle class families that uh, are being pinched. Uh, and when they go to the pump and they see that the, the prices at the pump are uh, up to a dollar cheaper than they were last year, uh, that certainly means more money in the pocket of middle class families. Uh, that's good for those middle class families that the President believes uh, are so critical to the uh, success of our economy. Uh, it also is a testament to uh, the success that the U.S. has had uh, over the last several years, uh, in part because of the policies put forward by this administration, to increase uh, production 
uh, of domestic uh, oil and gas. Uh, it also is a testament to some of the policies this administration put in place five years ago to raise fuel efficiency standards. But, Josh, I understand all these things that you want to list, but are you, is the White House concerned about the economic implications of this fall in oil prices? Uh, this is something that we're, we're always monitoring. I believe we talked about this a little bit at the end of last year. Um, but you know, the, we're, all, we're always monitoring the impact uh, that any sort of uh, uh, that any sort of policy uh, area would have on the economy. Uh, so it's certainly something that we're watching. I, I think that as a general uh, as a general matter, uh, speaking broadly, the impact of policy, uh, falling energy prices has been good for the U.S. economy. Okay. Michelle, um, any response to these recent statements by North Korea and? Are you surprised at the nature of some of them, that they're coming from a state, even though that state is North Korea? Mm -hmm. I, I, they're not particularly surprising. I, we've seen uh, comments from the North Koreans uh, uh, in the past. Um, you know, as it relates to uh, the subject that's received so much attention in the last few weeks, the, the hack of uh, uh, a Sony Pictures Entertainment, um, you know, the administration spoke pretty clearly at the end of last week. Uh, by putting in place a new economic sanctions regime against three North Korean entities and ten individuals uh, as part of our proportional response uh, to that specific hacking incident. And the, uh, the speculation that's been out there from some analysts that it actually might have come from somewhere else besides North Korea, does the administration see no merit to some of the, those sort of statements out there? Well, the, this is an investigation that's being conducted by the FBI. Uh, they've obviously devoted significant resources to this. They have their own uh, area of expertise when it comes to these matters. Uh, and they have uh, come to the conclusion, based on the evidence, that North Korea was responsible for this. And uh, I don't see any reason to, uh, uh, to disagree with, their, with the conclusions that they've arrived at. If you have questions about why they've re arrived at that, a conclusion you can direct it to them. And the president mm -hmm. called this incident um, an act of cyber vandalism. Mm -hmm. But we know that there is a review going on as to whether North Korea should be on the list of state sponsors of terror. So does that mean that there's a possibility the president is, is going to reconsider what he called this hack? Or is that review of North Korea possibly being on the list based on, on purely other activities by North Korea? Uh, it does not mean that the president is uh, is reconsidering the way that he talks about this. But what uh, is prudent is that our national security team is always reviewing uh, the actions, particularly of nations like North Korea, uh, to determine the proper policy response, and, and in some cases whether or not uh, that includes including them on the uh, state sponsor of terrorism list. Now, there, uh, I will say that the uh, there is a very specific technical uh, definition for uh, how states. Uh, or why individual countries should be added to that list. Uh, and so we will work uh, very carefully to determine uh, whether or not the actions that have been taken by North Korea meet that very specific uh, technical definition. Yeah, and, I mean, the fact that North Korea is not on that list, Cuba is, both are under review, that, that doesn't say a lot about that list and, and its, its weight. Well, I actually think that it might actually say quite a bit about the weight of that list. Uh, the fact that we take so seriously uh, those nations that do sponsor acts of terrorism, uh, that they are in a very small club. Uh, but that is, uh, that is a list that, um, uh, that, that you don't want to be on. Uh, and it's a list that we take very seriously as we uh, you know, formulate a, a foreign policy that protects the national security interests of the United States. And the fact that uh, we make a very, uh, take a de very deliberative approach to determining whether or not uh, a country should be added to the list or removed from the list, I think is an indication of just how serious a matter uh, a state sponsor of terrorism is. Thanks, Josh. Okay. Move around a little bit. Justin? Um, I wanted to go back to Mitch McConnell. He, in an interview uh, this morning, published in the Washington Post, said that the single best thing that uh, the Republican Congress could do is not mess up the playing field for 2016, the, the Republican presidential nominee. So I'm kind of interested in the inverse of that question, which is, is that President Obama's kind of number one priority headed into the last few years, or to what extent is preparing the Democratic Party for the 2016 elections and a leader that would presumably continue his vision a, a priority or something that's on your guys' agenda? And conversely, 
to what extent are you guys trying to foil Mitch McConnell's plan to sort of, uh, he, he wanted the Republicans to seem less crazy, I guess, with one word. Scary, I think. Was oh, scary, yeah. 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 Um, typically, the beginning of the year is uh, a time for optimism, where we set our sights high, where we really pursue our grandest ambitions. We make New Year's resolutions for ourselves about how much we're going to read more books or go to the gym more often. and. Uh, Suggesting that they're going to be less scary is not exactly the uh, highest ceiling I can imagine for their uh, legislative accomplishments this year, but uh, a worthy pursuit nonetheless. The, what I will say is that the, uh, the president does have, uh, in the vein of ambition, uh, a lot that he wants to try to get done this year. And uh, over the course of this week, even, you'll hear the president talk quite a bit about steps that he can take. Uh, to strengthen our economy, uh, particularly to benefit middle class families. The President believes our economy is strongest when we're growing from the middle out. Uh, and I do think you can hear the President, uh, expect to hear the President talking uh, in detailed fashion uh, about some of the executive actions that he can pursue and some of the legislative proposals that he'll put forward that he believes deserve bipartisan support. Uh, and you know, this is something different, this is a little different than what we've done in the past. This is an opportunity for him to talk about the State of the Union address. Uh, as uh, we get closer to the date where he actually give the speech, so a little bit more of a preview than we've seen in previous years. Uh, and I do think it is indicative of the kind of energy that the President is feeling, and frankly even optimism that the President is feeling, uh, that we can build on the kind of momentum that we're seeing in our economy right now uh, to put in place policies that will be good for middle class families and be good for the broader U.S. economy. Um, are Democrats and Republicans going to agree on every aspect of the President's strategy? Probably not. Um, but are there some things where we feel like we can work together uh, to get things done that uh, will be consistent with the ambitions of both parties uh, and consistent with a strategy that will be in the best interest of the country and middle class families in the country? Yeah, I think we can. And whether it's, you know, I also noted uh, in that same interview, Senator McConnell talked about uh, finding new ways to uh, invest in infrastructure. Uh, he talked about policies we can put in place to open up markets. Uh, for U.S. businesses, uh, and he talked about tax reform. So these are all areas where uh, there does uh, stand the potential for bipartisan agreement, and the President is certainly going to pursue them. Uh, the President is also going to pursue some other things that Republicans may not like that he can do on his own. So, I mean, I recognize I kind of teed you up there to, to talk about the next week, but I am actually interested in the sort of 2016 question, the extent yeah. to which this is starting to enter your guys' kind mm -hmm. of calculations. Politically, obviously, the president's time in office is waning, but his legacy and will be extended, and especially in his or his successor. Yeah. Well, the president, uh, as you may have heard from some of my colleagues uh, after the last midterm election, that with the president sees it a little bit differently. That uh, essentially, you know, today marks the beginning of the fourth quarter of his presidency, uh, and as the president, an avid basketball fan, has observed, uh, a lot of really important things happen in the fourth quarter, uh, and I think the president believes. Uh, that's true not just in an NBA uh, basketball game, it's also true of, uh, of a presidency. Uh, and he wants to make it true of his presidency. Uh, and that I, do th that I do think is why you will see the president um, pretty energized when he appears later this week, that he's going to have a pretty ambitious list uh, of priorities that he wants to uh, achieve. Uh, we're going to look for opportunities to work with Republicans to make progress on those, uh, on those priorities. And where Republicans don't agree, you're going to see the president take decisive action to, uh, to make progress uh, on his own where he can. Uh, and that is, I recognize, not a significant departure from the strategy that we have uh, employed uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, but I do think that you're going to see uh, the President be even more energized and even more determined uh, to make progress uh, on behalf of middle class families. That's, uh, after all, the reason the President ran for this office in the first place. Uh, and the President's going to spend a lot of time focused on that here in the, uh, the fourth quarter of his presidency. And I guess, the, so I guess the last part of that is, and that, uh, all that is to say, that means that the presidential election in 2016 is quite a ways off still. Uh, and the President believes that we should be focused on, uh, uh, on the kinds of policy priorities that are going to benefit middle class families. There will be plenty of time for politics. And then just on uh, Steve Scalise, I know that you talked a little bit about it with Julie, but I'm wondering, uh, did the President have a reaction to, to hearing that he had attended these rallies or the, the statement that you attributed to him? Have you had a conversation with him about it, or does does he think Steve Scalise should resign over this? Are there those sorts of 
kind of feelings or sentiments coming from? Well, I, ha I haven't spoken to him directly about this specific issue. I can tell you that, um, but I do feel confident in, in relaying to you that the president does believe that ultimately it's the responsibility of individual members of the House Republican Conference to decide who they want to uh, elect as their as a leader of their conference, uh, and uh, certainly who those elected leaders are says a lot about who the conference is and what their priorities and values are. Uh, and they're going to have to answer for themselves uh, whether or not elevating somebody who described himself as uh, David Duke without the baggage uh, it sort of reinforces the kind of message that the House Republican Conference wants to project. Okay. Cheryl. Yeah, thanks. Um, just to, on the legislative agenda, do you see the omnibus as, as sort of the model where you're going to start seeing legislation that may have some things that you really don't like, but you're going to sign it anyway because it's probably the best compromise you're going to get? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, um, I, do, I would anticipate that anything that the most substantial pieces of legislation that we hope to get done will necessarily be compromises. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that those pieces of legislation will include things that we strenu strenuously oppose. It just may be that there are pieces of legislation that we feel like don't go quite far enough, but are certainly a, a positive step in the right direction. Uh, but I think either of those scenarios fits what uh, would be an acceptable definition of a compromise. Uh, and I would anticipate that when we're operating in an environment where we have Republicans in charge of the Congress and a Democrat in charge of the White House, uh, that compromise is going to be the name of the game. Uh, and I certainly will hope, uh, and the President certainly hopes, that Republicans are in um, uh, will pursue uh, our work together in that spirit. Okay. Olivia. Josh, uh, the country's largest police union today uh, said that national hate crime statutes should be expanded to include attacks on police officers. Does the president agree? Uh, I hadn't seen that statement. Um, I, uh, I think that's something we'll have to consider. Obviously, um, you know, we certainly condemn in the strongest possible terms any sort of uh, violence against uh, police officers. And, you know, just a couple of weeks ago in New York, we saw a brazen act of violence that um, really shook that community uh, in New York. And, um, you know, even, even here a couple of weeks later, you know, the thoughts, of, uh, thoughts and prayers of everybody here at the White House, including the President and First Lady, continue to be uh, with the families of those two officers who uh, were killed in that terrible attack. Uh, so I, I think the question, though, uh, is ultimately, what are the kinds of things that we can do to uh, make it safer for police officers to do their important work? Uh, and this will be among the things that will be considered by uh, the task force that the President appointed at the end of last year. Uh, they're going to be uh, uh, holding their first public meeting next week. Uh, they'll hear from uh, the representatives of law enforcement organizations. Uh, because the President does believe that, uh, that building stronger bonds of trust between the community uh, and the law enforcement officers who are sworn to serve and protect that community uh, is in the best interests both of the police officers and the citizens of those communities. So trying to find that common ground and putting in place policies and looking for best practices that, uh, you know, where other communities have been able to identify that common ground uh, is going to be part of the very important work of this task force and the President's looking forward uh, to their findings. Okay. John. Um, back to North Korea. Uh, given that there have been some doubts raised about, uh, you know, private sector analysts looking at this and raising doubts about whether or not North Korea was actually responsible for the, the hack, uh, is there some consideration to declassifying the evidence uh, that, that, that shows that, in fact, North Korea has done this to give some confidence in the, uh, the finding of the, uh, well, of the FBI on this? Uh, well, I, I, I know that I, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that there are a couple of uh, private sector organizations that have endorsed the findings of the, of the FBI. So there are some people who have looked at the evidence and come down on, on, a, on a couple of different sides of this. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, what they're dealing with here is something that's pretty sensitive, right? The, uh, the evidence that they have reviewed and obtained uh, by making it public uh, does give a pretty strong indication to the North Koreans and, frankly, to other bad actors. Uh, about the techniques that we use to investigate and to attribute these kinds of attacks. So it's, uh, it's a tricky business here. I wouldn't rule out uh, in the future that, uh, that the FBI may be able to be more uh, transparent about their findings, but, uh, uh, but I'd refer you to them in terms of what they feel like they can um, uh, comfortably release without 
um, undermining some of the strategies that, strategies that they use, both to protect our infrastructure but also to investigate uh, intrusions. By using the phrase or the word cyber vandalism to describe this, is the president downplaying the significance of it? Cyber vandalism, or the word vandalism, sounds a lot less serious than the word terrorism, as some others have suggested. Uh, I think it sounds less serious, but I th I, I, the president certainly believes, takes this incident, uh, this attack, as something serious. It had a serious uh, financial impact on uh, this uh, American company. Uh, it obviously had a serious impact on the, uh, some of the values that we hold dear in this country about freedom of expression and the freedom of speech. Uh, and so I, it was not the President's intent uh, to downplay this at all. I think the President was looking for a way that uh, most accurately described exactly what uh, had occurred. Okay, two other uh, topics. One, uh, the, the news over the weekend that Boko Haram has taken over a Nigerian base on the, on the border with Chad. Um, how much confidence does the White House have in the ability of the Nigerian government to deal with this threat? How significant do you think the threat of Boko Haram is? Uh, and what's the United States, is there any role for the United States to do anything about it? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'll say a couple things about this, John. The first is, you know, there obviously is uh, a counterterrorism cooperation relationship between the United States and uh, a number of countries in Africa, including Nigeria. Uh, and that kind of cooperation uh, has been valuable in the past uh, in trying to help central governments uh, in Africa and other places in the world, frankly, uh, combat some of these extremist elements in their countries. Uh, so that counterterrorism relationship is ongoing. The, the clearest manifestation of that cooperation is uh, the deployment of some military personnel uh, that are on the ground in Nigeria to try to uh, uh, help recover uh, those girls who were kidnapped from that school uh, uh, early, you know, relatively early last year. Uh, that, so that work is ongoing, uh, but this is, uh, this is very difficult work, uh, and uh, you know, we're going to continue to cooperate uh, with the Nigerians as they uh, try to do a better job of securing their country. But isn't this an indication that that, that cooperation is not working at all? I mean, first of all, the girls haven't been rescued. Uh, that's on one side. The other side, Boko Haram uh, seems to be on the march. I mean, they've actually overtaken a military base uh, that was set up in large part to fight Boko Haram. Mm -hmm. I mean, doesn't this show that whatever cooperation we have with the Nigerians just isn't working? Well, it shows that um, that there is, uh, uh, you know, that they, that they face a very serious threat uh, in Nigeria, and uh, you know, the uh, the United States is. Uh, it does have this relationship with Nigeria that we value. It's a military-to-military -military relationship. We also share uh, some other, uh, uh, other intelligence assets that have been deployed uh, to fight Boko Haram. Uh, but this is certainly something that, uh, that we're concerned about. And just one last question on the uh, Cuba deal. Part of it was uh, the Cuban government agreeing to release 53 political prisoners. Uh, do you have an update for us on how many of the 53 have been released? Have they all been released uh, and, and who they are? Uh, for a specific update, I'm going to have to take the question and we'll get back to you. It's my understanding that not all of them have been released at this point, but, uh, but it, as part of the agreement that was brokered, that this, re this prisoner's re prisoner release uh, that, the, that the Cuban government decided to undertake on their own in the context of these discussions uh, would take place in stages. Uh, so, but but they're going to follow through on this? I mean, there's often reports that the Cubans have arrested some additional uh, what I would say is, at this point, there is no reason to think that they are walking back uh, any part of the agreement. Uh, but we'll see if we can get you some more details. Okay. JC? How concerned is this administration, and how closely has this administration been monitoring what is going on Wall Street right now, where the Dow has gone below 300, and the euro has reached its lowest mark in nine years? Uh, the concerns are the instability in the Greek government and the new elections there, that Greece will, in fact, abandon the euro. Um, what, what is the situation? How does, how does the White House look at this? Well, JC, I can tell you that you know we're, we're always monitoring uh, movements in the uh, uh, in the financial markets, uh, but uh, in terms of sort of ascribing you know what may be driving those uh, those uh, fluctuations in the market, I, I wouldn't speculate uh, on that. Uh, but obviously, uh, this administration has been working very closely with our partners in Europe uh, as they've worked to deal with some of the. Uh, financial challenges that they faced over the last several years, uh, both as it relates to some members of uh, the EU, but also as it relates to the broader economic trends uh, over in Europe. Uh, we uh, and I, you know, we had a, 
You recall that uh, the chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, Jason Furman, spoke at this podium a couple of weeks ago, uh, and he discussed uh, some concern uh, about headwinds from Europe, that they're uh, weakening the economy, uh, certainly not in the best interests of uh, the U.S. economy. Um, but at the same time, the strength uh, of the U.S. economy is, um, is due, at least in part, to some of the very important and difficult policy decisions that the President made uh, early on in his, uh, his presidency. Mark? Gas taxes, uh, Josh. Um, mm -hmm. The new year and, of course, the plunging oil prices and the <coughs> plunging price of the gallon has renewed uh, the talk of raising uh, gas taxes, the federal uh, gas tax, to help pay for infrastructure. In the past, you guys have said that's not on the table. Is it on the table now? Well, it's not something that we have uh, proposed, uh, and that's been our, that's been our policy. We uh, have put forward our own very specific proposal for how we believe we can make the investment that's needed in, in, uh, in infrastructure in this country. That's typically what the gas tax revenue is dedicated to, is uh, investing in infrastructure. And we have put forward our own specific plan for closing uh, loopholes that uh, only benefit wealthy and well-connected corporations and using the revenue from closing those loopholes uh, to investing uh, in badly needed infrastructure upgrades. There are some in Congress that have different ideas, and, uh, including uh, raising the gas tax. Uh, that's certainly something that we'll take a look at, but it's not something that we have uh, we have considered from here. Okay. I, I asked because among those proposals, Bob Corker and, and Chris Murphy have wanted to raise the gas tax by 12 cents a gallon mm -hmm. uh, over two years, I guess it is. As you say, there are others. Are you at this? At the, two questions. Are you A, ruling a gas uh, tax increase out, and B, is the President going to say something specific on infrastructure and gas taxes in the State of the Union? Uh, I don't have anything to preview at this point uh, about uh, uh, for, from the State of the Union on this specific topic, uh, but we may have more in advance of the speech, so stay tuned. The, uh, as it relates to specific proposals from Congress, we'll certainly consider uh, proposals that are put forward, uh, particularly bipartisan proposals like the one that you uh, mentioned. Uh, but we've been really clear about what we think is the best way to get this done, and that is simply to uh, close loopholes that benefit only the wealthy and well-connected uh, corporations uh, and use that revenue to make badly needed investments in infrastructure that everybody benefits from. Uh, I recognize that there are some other ideas out there, and we'll consider those too. But we've been really clear about what we what we support. Okay, Josh, Mara. Just to follow up on that, um, the gas tax is a kind of permanent, ongoing way to fund infrastructure. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about is a one-time only closing of loopholes to get some money for for infrastructure investments. Do you, do you think, as others have suggested, that the gas tax is a funding mechanism for infrastructure is broken and should be replaced by another mechanism? Uh, I'm not saying that, although some have pointed out that the fact that we have, um, that, that our vehicles that are on the road are becoming more fuel efficient, which means they're using less gas, which means that there's likely to be less revenue from a gas tax. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what we have said is that we've, um, you know, we believe there is a very specific way uh, that we can close some loopholes that will generate revenue, that will um, allow us to make some badly needed investments in infrastructure. That's, and not, oh, that's not a permanent funding of infrastructure, permanent funding stream for infrastructure. That's just a one-time well, only. Well, it, it could be, right, because okay. we're talking about permanently closing the, uh, the loopholes. And that amount of money? That, could be a, that would be a change in the, in the tax policy. It could be. I know, but do you envision it as something that funds infrastructure over time? I don't really understand how that becomes a permanent uh, infrastructure's funding source. Well, it, we're not suggesting that we abolish the gas tax, right? Okay. So, um, but there is revenue that could be gleaned from reforming the tax code uh, and generating revenue that could be used to invest in, in infrastructure. And so that's what, our, that's what our strategy is. I recognize that there are other people that have uh, other ideas, and we'll certainly consider those ideas as they put them forward. Major. Is the reluctance to talk about the gas tax because you believe gas prices trending downward are likely to reverse in the not too distant future and you don't want to mess with anything in the price market for or taxes for fuel? I think the reluctance that you're perceiving from me is that we believe, frankly, that we have a better idea for how to do this, uh, which is that by closing loopholes that only benefit wealthy and well-connected corporations, we can actually invest in the kind of infrastructure that will create jobs stimulate economic growth, and put in place modern infrastructure that we can all benefit from. So uh, we're open to these other ideas that others have put forward, uh, but you know, we believe our, ideas, our idea is better, uh, but I'm not no willing to... what the price of gas is. 
Uh, well, I mean, this is a, this is a position that we've had for some time, oh, no. right? And, and, and there are a lot of uh, energy economists who said, well, look, this is a different, this is a time for a different conversation because the prices are down and there's more room within what people used to budget and the infrastructure needs of the country haven't gotten any better. They've become more pronounced, if anything. Right. And it's time for a fresh look at this. And, and I hear from you, you're not inclined to give it a fresh look. Well, I th and I'm just trying to figure out why. Uh, I think what I'm trying to say is that we, we're, we continue to remain open to giving it a look if somebody wants to put forward their own proposal. Again, this sort of goes to Cheryl's question in some ways about compromise. We don't believe that the best way to fund uh, uh, modernizing our infrastructure is to raise the gas tax, but some people do, uh, and we're willing to, uh, to, uh, uh, to consider those proposals. We believe that the best way to do that uh, is to close, uh, close loopholes that only benefit the wealthy and well-connected corporations. Okay. Uh, interpreting your comments earlier that you may or may not have a meeting, the President may or may not have a meeting with congressional leaders on the Republican side this week. It sounds like they probably won't, looking at the schedule. Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that that is a lesser priority than getting out on the road and sort of previewing the State of the Union and displaying the President's energetic pursuit of his own agenda and not treating the new congressional Republican majority as a secondary item, but not as important as his own rhetorical uh, flourishes for this week. <laughs> well, I think we're less focused on rhetorical, flour rhetorical flourishes and more interested in substantive policy ideas that will get our economy moving and benefit middle class families. That's what we're going to be focused on on the road. Uh, and that's what we'll be focused on in our conversations with uh, Democrats and Republicans uh, who are in leadership positions in Congress. Look, the President met with, uh, with congressional leaders a couple of times during the lame duck session. Uh, and I'm confident that he'll do it again uh, early this year. Right, but it's just a different crew and a different power structure than during the lame duck. I mean, I know it's well, the same participants, but they're invested with different It's pretty much power. all the same participants, isn't it? Right, but they, have, but they have different levels of power, and their proximity yeah. to them is completely different. But, I, but even in the context of those meetings that they had in the lame duck, they were talking about this. Everybody knew what was going to happen after the first of the year, right? Everybody knew that the president wasn't just meeting with the Senate Minority Leader. He was also meeting with the incoming Senate Majority Leader. So I don't think that that will substantively change the kinds of conversations that they'll have early this year, which uh, the president believes is important, and he'll he'll do, but uh, certainly there's no, um, there's no reason we can't do both, right? That what, what the President wants to do is he wants to make progress uh, by debating and putting in place where possible substantive economic policy ideas that will benefit the middle class. Some of those he can do on his own and he's going to do it. Some of those he's going to require uh, cooperation with Republicans in Congress to get it done and he's eager to do that too. Right. Uh, I know you don't want to preview the State of the Union, but uh, the last time the President gave an address like that, there was no war against ISIS. There was no ongoing airstrike and a coalition to confront it in two different countries. Now there is. So two questions. To what degree will the President use the State of the Union to give the country an assessment of what has been accomplished and what remains to be done? And how does the ongoing conflict influence the defense budget that is being put together? and the ongoing discretionary cap limits that have one more year to go in a full budget cycle after this. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I, the, the State of the Union hasn't been written yet, so I wouldn't want to speculate about sort of... He's been working on it, as you and I both uh, he, is, he has been, but uh, ultimately he's not the author of it, no, even I if he's know. been working on it. So. But it's not like there's a bunch of blank pay, pieces of paper hanging around. No, but it's not as if the uh, final words that are on the page are going to be the ones that will be read by the President of the United States on January 20th. But you know so, seems to get blocked out. What I'm just trying to figure out is how much does the President feel it's necessary yeah. or worthwhile to assess what is a, a not insignificant national I, 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 you, You're asking a very legitimate question. I'm just trying to, to make it clear that, um, that, the, that, that those are the, we're still having those kinds of discussions about what actually is going to be included in there and to what extent it will be included. But I am confident as a general matter uh, that the President will use the opportunity of that national address uh, to talk about uh, the threat uh, that we face from ISIL. Uh, and what the United States continues to do by leading this broader international coalition of, uh, of more than 60 countries to, uh, to uh, degrade and ultimately destroy them. Uh, this is a multi-front uh, strategy that includes uh, airstrikes that we're taking in support of troops on the ground. It involves uh, combating foreign fighters. It involves counterfinance, which you've heard uh, David Cohen from the Treasury Department talk about from here. Uh, it talks about important work that needs to be done on the humanitarian front. Uh, and it, continue, it also includes uh, the efforts that we have undertaken working closely with our allies to counter ISIL's message in the Muslim world. So this is a multifaceted effort 
uh, and I am confident that you hear the president talk about this a little bit, uh, at least. Um, as it relates to the second question about the, the Defense Department budget, there obviously are, uh, there, I there is an impact on the Defense Department budget uh, as a result of these ongoing efforts. That's one of the reasons that uh, our priorities for the lame duck was getting some increased funding so we could ensure that we had the necessary resources uh, to carry out this strategy. Uh, and you know, one of the other things that we talked about in the context of the omnibus was how disappointed we were uh, that Congress didn't act on the kinds of budgetary reforms that both the civilian and military leadership at the Pentagon said were desperately needed. Uh, and so I would anticipate that all of that, uh, maybe not discussed in that much detail in the State of the Union, uh, but it certainly will be a priority uh, as we uh, uh, talk to Congress about the FY16 budget. Uh, and during the holiday break, several more detainees were repatriated from Guantanamo, and the indication is that that's going to be something that will be rather common in the next three or four months. Would you be willing to say that this is something that the administration <laughs> intends to accelerate in the early part of 2015 to move as many detainees as are movable out of Guantanamo in the early part of this year? I don't have, frankly, a lot of insight into what the short-term plans are in terms of who is uh, and, and sort of what sort of agreements are being contemplated and, you know, what troops are, are, uh, are up for transfer in the short term. I can tell you that it continues to be an important priority of this administration to uh, ultimately transfer all of the, de the detainees out of Guantanamo. But the President um, conceded publicly that's not possible. Some aspects uh, are too dangerous and can't be tried. Well, which is why we need Congress to take some action uh, to remove some of the obstacles that are preventing uh, the President from uh, doing something that he believes is clearly in the national interest, which is closing the President Guantanamo Bay. One last thing. David Cameron said over the weekend that the President calls him bro. Is that true? And is there any other pet names he has for world leaders? Well, to paraphrase uh, a local uh, baseball player here in uh, Washington, D.C., that's a clown question, bro. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, I don't mean that. No, I don't. Mostly because I just wanted to use bro in my own response. Yeah, and so. clown, you know. <laughs> Uh, I, I am not able to um, give much more insight about the private communications between uh, the President of the United States and the uh, Prime Minister of uh, the United Kingdom, other than to feel publicly, do you have any reason to doubt the Prime Minister's assertion? Uh, I don't, because as you know, they have a special relationship. <laughs> so, Peter. Uh, given Mitch McConnell's unusual admonition to the Republican majority that they should not be scary, I want to get a sense from you right now. Does the President think the American people should be scared of a Republican governing majority? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think the President has uh, been pretty clear that there is a pretty stark difference of, uh, of opinion uh, about which policies are actually in the best interest of the country, uh, about which, what kinds of policies are going to be the best interest of middle class families. Uh, that is, after all, the President's priority. And I think by some of the policy cho choices we've seen some of the Republicans make, uh, they don't share that priority. Uh, and that certainly is a strong difference of opinion. Um, but ultimately, I guess we'll have to sort of see uh, whether or not um, members of Congress uh, choose to abide by the uh, admonition of the uh, new Senate Majority Leader. I mean, you know, one example I guess I can think of is that it, the, the prospect of, uh, uh, of defaulting on the debt uh, for the first time in our nation's history is a scary prospect. Um, hopefully it's not going to come to that. Um, but, you know, we'll have to, we'll have to see. I, I guess I would say it this way. Uh, the President does believe that there are some areas where we can cooperate. So setting aside whether or not they're scary or not, uh, we do believe that there may be an opportunity for us to find some areas of common ground uh, where uh, Democrats and Republicans can come together to, uh, you know, open up overseas markets for American businesses or to reform the tax code in a way uh, that would actually make it more simple and more fair and close loopholes that only benefit uh, the wealthy and well-connected. So there may be some things that we can do uh, to cooperate and actually get, make some progress for the American people. We know, Mayor, uh, back to law enforcement, New York City Police Department, but police departments nationwide, some of which have indicated that the rank and file there feel betrayed by uh, the President, by Attorney General Eric Holder. Earlier you indicated that the President basically um, feels uh, certainly feels a sympathy for the loss experienced by the families in New York, but does the President feel a sympathy with those police, members of police departments right now, who feel targeted? Well, I think what the President believes is that it's clearly in the best interests of, uh, of people who are living in communities that have legitimate concerns. Uh, 
and clearly in the best interests of law enforcement officers that have legitimate concerns, to come together and try to strengthen the bond of trust between uh, law enforcement officers and the communities that they're sworn to serve and protect. And that that is, uh, that is a pursuit that uh, is important and would benefit communities all across the country. It certainly would stand to benefit uh, uh, law enforcement officers who do the heroic work every day of getting up, putting on a blue uniform, uh, and putting their lives on the line to protect the, to protect the community that they work in. And that is, uh, that is a calling that the President believes is worthy of our um, honor and respect. Uh, and if there are things that we can do to make it uh, safer for them to do that important work, while at the same time inspiring greater trust uh, in the communities that they uh, are sworn to serve and protect, uh, that that's a good thing, that that is a laudable goal. And ultimately, it will have the effect uh, of fighting crime in communities all across the country. Mayor Bill de Blasio is going to speak in a matter of moments when we leave this briefing. We'll hear some of his remarks given the latest that's been taking place up there. Uh, recently, po uh, Police Commissioner Bratton called it very inappropriate that the officers turned their back uh, to the mayor during the eulogy for Officer Ramos. Does the president agree with Bratton? Well, I haven't spoken to the president about it. I, I do think that the that Commissioner Bratton did have uh, did have, I think, a, an important view that he expressed on this. He described this is a letter that he sent to uh, to uh, police precincts all across uh, the uh, the city of New York, and he said uh, it was not all officers, uh, and it was not disrespect directed at director at Detective Ramos, but all officers were painted by it. Uh, and it stole the valor, honor, and attention that rightfully belonged to the memory of Detective Rafael Ramos's life and service. That was not the intent, I know, but it was the result. So, uh, so again, those are the. Was, so I guess simply, even if, broadly speaking, does the White House think that action is inappropriate? Uh, I, I think what I will say is that uh, the the part of Commissioner Bratton's letter I think that resonates uh, most strongly here at the White House uh, is that those who are attending those funerals. Um, are there to pay their respect for the service and sacrifice uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the two officers who are being laid to rest. And uh, certainly the President uh, has, uh, believes that their service and their sacrifice uh, is worthy of celebration uh, and respect uh, and should be afforded all of the outward symbols of honor uh, that they've been given. And I think that's what the vast majority uh, of people who attended those funerals, including police officers who attended those funerals, uh, actually did. Digressing very briefly, we just learned um, a short time ago that two aspiring U.S. ski team members were killed in an avalanche in Austria. Um, that information is just coming to us. I don't know whether you guys have been made aware or if the president was aware or had any thoughts given that tragedy to U.S. aspiring Olympic athletes. Uh, Peter, I'm, I was not aware of that report. Uh, obviously, you know, the president has on a number of occasions had the opportunity to welcome uh, Olympic athletes to the White House, uh, both uh, as they're preparing for uh, competition and, and after they have competed. And obviously, our, uh, our thoughts and prayers are with those who are apparently lost in this uh, specific incident. Uh, these are uh, young men and women who uh, make our country proud. Uh, and uh, certainly, they, they dedicate their lives to uh, their pursuit and their calling and their passion, uh, which is the performance in their sport. Uh, and so I, I'm not aware of the specific report, but certainly, if it's true, it is a tragedy. Thanks. Ed. Josh, another update over the holidays would, uh, would be uh, these recommendations to reform the Secret Service. And I wonder, um, has the President actually been given some sort of a report or a briefing? Uh, and where is the White House specifically on this increased speculation that we might see the security fence outside raised? That was one of the recommendations. And so where specifically is the President, White House staff on that? Uh, that's a good question, Ed. I have not, I don't know whether or not the President has um, uh, has received a specific briefing, but we'll follow up with you on this. Okay. So, uh, I, I, as, as you'll recall, the President did have an interest in reviewing this report. So, right. uh, I just want to get on the record. So yeah, uh, we we'll look into it and get back with you. Um, specifically, I'm working with Congress, following up on, on both Julie and Major on, on the meeting, not just the meeting itself, but why not meet with the Republican leaders this week. But you and others are giving this impression the President's ready to work with Republican leaders. <clears throat> but no meeting this week, probably. Instead, he's going out on the road on his own and did this interview with NPR over the holidays where he said, I'm ready to start vetoing a lot more stuff, and there's going to be a lot more executive action. So aren't you saying he's going to work with Republicans, but his actions are actually speaking louder than those words? Mm -hmm. Well, Ed, I think uh, the President's action to uh, invite the congressional leaders, both Democrats and Republicans, to the White House just a couple of days after the midterm elections uh, and talk about where that common ground is, I do think that that speaks to the President's, the priority that the President places uh, in working with 
uh, Republicans to make progress for the American people. But uh, you're also right that the fact that the president is uh, going to start the new year by announcing some new executive actions and some new policy proposals that will benefit uh, middle class families uh, indicates that he's most focused on results. He's focused mostly focused on substantive, substantive policy ideas that will benefit middle class families. Yet. And you're already talking about it. He's moving forward on executive action. He's yeah. going out on the road to go directly yeah. to the American people. He's free to do that, but yeah. he hasn't even been sworn in yet. You're saying he's getting ready to do more executive action? Yeah, uh, he is. Uh, and the president is determined to make progress where he can on his own. Uh, as the president has said many times, particularly in the aftermath of the midterm elections, uh, we can't allow a, you know, a disagreement over one thing to be a, dis a deal breaker over all the others. So. Uh, I have no doubt that there will be some Republicans who are going to be critical uh, of policy proposals that the President pursues on his own to benefit middle class families. That's, that may be an area where an honest disagreement exists. What we're mostly focused on when we have conversations with Republicans, though, uh, is figuring out where is their common ground? Where, where do we agree? Uh, and the, the disagreements may be more plentiful, uh, but that's all the more reason we should spend a lot of time looking for uh, that area of common ground. And the President. Uh, uh, we'll do that. He did that at the end of last year. He'll do it uh, as this year gets underway as well. Last thing, Republicans talking again, as they have, have many times before, about trying to change the president's health care law. And I wanted to ask you specifically, not about that, but about this new book from Stephen Brill, because this was not a quick drive-by. He spent, I believe, 19 months interviewing a lot of people around here. And, and from what I've seen of it so far, he points out the good of get, getting millions more people insurance. But both in the book and some of his early television interviews, he's indicating that he believes this is, after studying it very closely, it's a raw deal for taxpayers. That a lot more people are getting insurance, but the taxpayers are picking up that tap. And that the health care costs are not coming down because of the law itself, despite what was promised. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let me say a couple things about that, Ed. The first thing is it's important for people to remember uh, that the Affordable Care Act substantially reduced the deficit, which is good for the economic health. Uh, and the fiscal health of the country, uh, and also good for taxpayers. And we have seen uh, that the growth in health care costs has been lower uh, than at any other time in recorded history, in almost 50 years since they've been measuring that specific statistic. We've also seen that uh, the average premium for employer-based health care coverage, these are individuals who are not essentially not really affected by the Affordable Care Act, or certainly aren't getting health insurance because of the Affordable Care Act, they saw that their premiums only went up uh, three percent, even though in previous years it had been going up by double digits every year. So uh, one of the goals, as Mr. Brill points out in his book, uh, has been to limit the growth in health care costs. And the numbers indicate that very early on that there has been very important success associated with the Affordable Care Act uh, in doing exactly that. And that's something that we're going to continue to do, in addition to uh, expanding coverage and getting more people covered with health care, uh, in addition to putting in place the kind of patient protections that the President has long advocated, everything from uh, ensuring that uh, men and women can get the kind of preventative uh, health care maintenance annual checkups and things, that those can be covered free of charge, uh, that you can't be discriminated against because you have a pre-existing condition. Uh, we can put in place all those things and we can actually limit the growth in health care costs and that's what the Affordable Care Act has done. And he also has this conclusion that from talking to the President's own advisors that people in the West Wing believe that the real Chief of Staff is Valerie Jarrett and, and that when he, when the author pressed the President himself in an interview, he just wouldn't comment on that. Why wouldn't the President knock that down? Why wouldn't he say, Valerie Jarrett's not my chief yeah. I, I think because everybody already knows that. And I think uh, that Ms. Jarrett obviously plays a very important role here uh, in the West Wing uh, and, in, and in advising the President of the United States. But I think she, even she would tell you that she's not the chief of staff and doesn't want to be. Alexis. Josh, can I follow up? Just a, I have two quick questions. One is a personnel question. Okay. We had anticipated that the President's counselor and maybe his senior advisor, um, I'm talking about Podesta and Pfeiffer, might leave in a few weeks. Can you update us on whether they're going to be departing the White House soon? Uh, I don't have any updates uh, on any personal matters at this point. You can't say whether um, John Podesta will indeed be leaving? Uh, well, I can say that, I mean, we said that uh, when he started last year that he would essentially be serving through uh, the end of, uh, end of the calendar year. He's going to stay on uh, at the beginning of this year to help with the State of the Union. I don't have an exact date for his departure, though. But uh, maybe February? Can well, I, 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 I don't have any guidance on that, but we'll keep you posted. Okay. Um, and you don't want to say anything about Dan? Uh, well, I'd, I'd say lots of things about Dan, uh, but I, in terms of his, uh, uh, in terms of any personnel announcements associated with Dan, I don't, I'm not aware of any. The second question is, um, at the end of the year, the percentage of people who said that they approved of the job that the President was doing went up, and lots of people have analyzed the polling numbers and why that is, and I was just wondering if the White House 
could share its own interpretation of why that percentage went up at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Well, I think like uh, financial markets, uh, it's always a tricky, risky business to try to analyze uh, what's actually driving fluctuations in, in poll numbers. Uh, I can tell you that uh, I think what I'd rather do is sort of convey to you why uh, so many people in this building felt really optimistic heading into the holidays at the end of last year. Uh, and that is because we did feel like over the course of the last uh, six weeks or so of last year uh, that we had uh, been able to make a lot of progress on a variety of important policy priorities that the President had identified. In some cases, we were able to work with Republicans to make progress. Uh, in some cases, we had to take, uh, the President had to take executive action over the objection of Republicans. But I do think it serves as a pretty useful model for the kind of approach that the President envisions for the fourth quarter of his presidency. We were able to work with Republicans to pass uh, an omnibus proposal that would uh, provide uh, the, uh, the certainty in, in government funding for just about every single federal agency. Uh, that's going to be good for the economy. It's good for businesses as they're planning. Uh, that, that is a, uh, uh, a priority that you've heard uh, those of us here at the White House talk about. It's also a priority that you've heard Republicans in, on Capitol Hill talk about. That's an, a good example of the kind of common ground uh, that we hope we'll be able to find uh, as it relates to other measures. Of course, there are other steps that the President took uh, that were not so warmly received by Republicans, but uh, whether it was reforming our broken immigration system and finally adding some more accountability to that system, uh, or, uh, you know, moving to naturalize or uh, uh, normalize our relationship with, uh, with Cuba, uh, that these are steps that the President believes are important to move in the country forward. And, um, uh, you know, even though Congressional Republicans didn't support those measures, the Chamber of Commerce was strongly supportive of both of those things. So uh, in some ways, just because Republicans in Congress oppose them doesn't mean that they're partisan. Uh, it just means that they don't happen to fit the, uh, 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 the priorities of Congressional Republicans, even though uh, there are a lot of other prominent Republicans that do happen to support those steps. So uh, I, I do think that as, the, as this fourth quarter plays out, you're going to see the President uh, pursue a strategy that does uh, look for areas where we can work with Republicans, uh, and take steps on his own where we can't. And uh, hopefully the, uh, we'll continue to see that trend in the poll numbers, too. Thanks, Josh. All right. Uh, Zeke, I'll give you the last one. Hi, thanks, Josh. Uh, going back earlier to a conversation with John regarding uh, Boko Haram, um, you, you had indicated that U.S. troops were still uh, there trying to look for the, uh, for the missing schoolgirls, except in the War Powers Resolution letter that the President sent to Congress in December, it mentioned that the ISR mission in, in Chad to find these girls had ended that only that only a small security cooperation force remained in Chad, um, separate from that mission. So, um, so you know, has something changed since December? Or I was hoping you can clarify that a little bit. Uh, I, I can have somebody follow up with you who uh, has some more knowledge of these details. I know that the uh, ongoing cooperation that has been underway for some time to work with the Nigerians to try to find the girls is still underway. I know there are some reports to the contrary uh, in the last few weeks. Uh, but in terms of helping you understand how that policy fits with this uh, War Powers letter, let me get somebody from the National Security Council to give you a call. And uh, following up on the Scalise conversation earlier, you said that if Republicans were to continue his, his position in leadership, it would say a lot about uh, the conference's values and their priorities. What would it say exactly? Well, again, I think that's, that's for, them to, for them to decide. And again, that's not necessarily me making an assertion that they would disagree with. I think all of them, uh, as they consider who they want to be uh, to serve in their leadership, uh, do so uh, knowing that their leaders are going to have a uh, are going to be more prominent uh, and will send a pretty clear signal about what their priorities are, about what their values are, and uh, what their conference represents. And so they'll have to decide for themselves what kind of message it sends uh, to elevate somebody who said that they were David Duke without the baggage. Are you saying when you said that you didn't have anything in mind about what it would say? I'm saying they have to decide for themselves You're exactly what that oh, message might say. <laughs> I'm sorry? What your, your political professional, communications professional, what message do you think you know, they're what risking sending? I've, I've, I've got plenty of my own thoughts, but they're irrelevant in this case, because what matters, I don't have a vote in the uh, House Republican Conference leadership elections. Uh, if I did, that would certainly be interesting, but I don't. Uh, so they'll have to make that d decision for themselves, and I'm sure that part of that decision will be what kind of message it sends. Look, the Chairman Priebus at the, uh, at the Republican National Committee says that Republicans uh, need to do more to broaden their appeal to women, minorities, uh, gays, and others, that the success of their political party uh, depends on it. And so they're going to have to they're going to have to decide for themselves that exact question. Hey, Thanks, uh, everybody. Just, just one more thing on this. So, yeah. Jimmy, you quoted uh, Scalise as saying he's David Duke without it the baggage. Like you're saying that's yeah. what it says. But, no, but, but uh, just like, would somebody 
described as thus, be welcome here at the White House? So well, here saying, is David Duke without the baggage, quoting as saying, calling himself David Duke without the baggage. Would somebody who fits that description be welcome here at the White House? Well, what I'll say is that the President will um, meet with uh, who the Republicans choose to serve in leadership positions in their conference. The President is willing to work uh, with Republicans to get something done. And if the Republicans make the decision to, uh, to uh, keep uh, Mr. Scalise in his leadership position, then the President will, will meet with him in pursuit of trying to, uh, to get some things done for the middle class. So thanks, everybody. Thank we'll you see you tomorrow. Thanks, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Is either that or don't tase me, bro? I couldn't really decide. No. Oh, man.